thanks very much everyone for uh, for coming out to this uh, round WCD roundtable on the theme of lobbying the autocrat. And the basic idea behind this uh, this roundtable is to look at the the world's most influential autocracies, Russia and China, and to ask, well, under what conditions, when and how do societies in Russia and China influence those autocracies in turn? And uh, the discussions we'll have today draw upon a uh, the new issue of the Democracy and Autocracy newsletter, to which uh, all of our panelists were contributors, among others. And it also draws upon what will be a, a forthcoming edited volume um, by Max Grumpin and Jessica Teets in the WCED book series at the University of Michigan Press. So we'll be zeroing in on China and Russia today, but we'll be asking some broader questions about under what conditions are autocrats influenced by, are autocracies influenced by the societies in which they govern and not just the other way around. So we have a, a terrific uh, panel um, and I'm gonna try to introduce everyone and get out of the way as quickly as possible here. Um, I should note also that our session is co-sponsored by uh, LRCCS, our China Studies Center, as well as by CRIS, our Center for Russia and East European Studies. So uh, our speakers today, First, we have Max Grumping. He is lecturer at the School of Government and International Relations at Griffith University. He researches interest group politics, comparative authoritarianism, and electoral integrity with a regional focus on Southeast Asia. Max previously worked as research associate at the Electoral Integrity Project at the University of Sydney and is a lecturer at Heidelberg University in Germany. Max's work has been published in political communication, governance, party politics, and democratization, among others. Jessica Tietz is associate professor at Middlebury College and associate editor of the Journal of Chinese Political Science. Her research focuses on governance in authoritarian regimes, especially the role of civic participation. She is the author of Civil Society Under Authoritarianism, The China Model with Cambridge University Press, and also editor with William Hurst of Local Governance Innovation in China, Experimentation, Diffusion, and Defiance. Manfred Elstrom is an assistant professor of economics, philosophy, and political science at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, and the author of Workers in Change in China, Resistance, Repression, Responsiveness. He has a doctorate from Cornell University and was previously a postdoctoral scholar and teaching fellow at the University of Southern California School of International Relations and a China Public Policy postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University's Ash Center for Democ Democratic Governance and Innovation. David Sacconi is an assistant professor of political science at the George Washington University and the co-founder of the Anti-Corruption Data Collective. His research focuses on corruption, clientelism, and political economy in Russia, Western Europe, and the United States. His book, Politics for Profit, Business, Elections, and Policymaking in Russia with Cambridge University Press, examines why business people run for elected political office worldwide. And last but certainly not least, Sasha DeVogel is a postdoctoral fellow at New York University's Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. She received her PhD in political science from the University of Michigan in 2021. Her research focuses on the politics of authoritarian regimes and collective action, particularly in Russia and the post-Soviet region, and has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, Harriman Institute, among others others. So we're going to start off with the um, sort of the leaders of the band, if you will, those who have uh, took the lead on our recent newsletter, which I urge everyone to take a look at, and of our new edited volume. So we're going to start uh, with Max Grumping. Thanks so much, Dan, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here, and I hope that um, this is visible to everyone. If you could give me a thumbs up. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the lands from which I speak to you, the Turbal and Yagara people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. What you see here on the slide is a picture I took in July 2013 in Phnom Penh during the Cambodian national election. And uh, it's a picture from a makeshift press tent where this advocacy coalition of Cambodian NGOs was trying very hard to appeal to the press um, and to the public to put the issue of electoral reform on the political agenda. In, in essence, they wanted to um, affect positive policy change in the space of how elections are run in this uh, electoral authoritarian regime. But uh, what I noted even back then was that among all those journalists, there were absolutely no Cambodian mainstream media present. And um, overall, I just kept asking myself, how much chance do they think they really have in influencing uh, anything about elections uh, in this country? 
what did they hope to achieve um, lobbying um, an autocratic regime in this manner? And more broadly speaking, well, how do people organize and mobilize to affect policy change in autocracies in such adverse conditions? So these were some of the questions um, that kind of have led me into this project uh, that after some years, after generous support from the German Fritz Thyssen Foundation, um, let me uh, to work together with Jessica and 16 fantastic co-authors. Um, and it ended up in this edited volume titled Lobbying the Autocrat. And what I'd like to do is to give you just a sneak peek at our empirical findings from this project. So to start with prevailing theories uh, of authoritarian politics, I would say, focus pretty much very much on political elites and how they use institutions to coerce and co-opt the public uh, to legitimate their rule vis-a-vis -vis society. And if I had to grossly exaggerate, I would say that citizens are more or less the passive terrain upon which autocrats act according um, to these prevailing theories. But at the same time, we also know many, many case studies from many different countries and in many different policy areas where advocacy organizations have actually made successful inroads into influencing policy outcomes. So how can we make sense of this? Uh, are these really genuine bottom-up um, inputs into authoritarian policymaking? Are they just facade civil society consultations? Uh, this motivates the basic uh, research question of our of our project how and to what effect do advocacy groups lobby autocratic governments to achieve favorable policy outcomes i'd like to just pause there and um, highlight two terms or two concepts that we use here and very happy to go into more detail in the q a but just to be on the same page what we understand in this project as advocacy groups are really formally organized civil society actors that are voluntary, uh, non-state, not-for-profit, and policy-focused. So those could be business associations, unions, NGOs, uh, professional association like you know the doctors' association, whatever, uh, or cause groups. What we don't focus on are political parties and intra-bureaucratic interest groups. And what we mean by lobbying is possibly broader than what comes to mind when you just intuitively think about the term lobbying. So we see lobbying as all of the activities that these advocacy groups undertake to achieve favorable policy outcomes. And that can go from inside lobbying tactics like contacting uh, bureaucrats, contacting legislators to outside lobbying tactics that appeal to the public, to the media, even via protest. So it's quite a broad spectrum that we look at. What we don't look at is uh, corruption clientelism as a tactic to influence policy outcomes. And we don't look at armed struggle either. In the book uh, that presents the project, we um, examine that research question empirically uh, through the different chapters. We have eight country cases in there. Some chapters are single country cases, some are comparative some longitudinal. We also have three large N analyses. And as you can see here on the slide, the, the case studies cover uh, quite a bit of ground from the most authoritarian on the VDEM liberal democracy index, which would be China, to the least authoritarian, which is Montenegro in our sample. And they also have some variation in their autocraticness. Some stay consistently autocratic during the period of observation and others change such as Malaysia or Turkey. So this is our empirical pool. And analytically, we lean on a framework that we adopt and adapt from the large neo-pluralist literature on interest representation. And that literature conceptually distinguishes four stages of what they call influence production. And you see this here on the slide, these four stages that I will discuss now in turn when presenting our empirical findings. But I should of course say that this is a framework that comes from a context of liberal democracy. And that whole pluralism, neo-pluralism literature is based in Western Europe and, and uh, North America, other liberal democracies. 
So we can't transplant this wholesale into authoritarian context, of course. But what Jessica and I do think, and our co-authors think, is that we can learn quite a lot from applying this lens to a different context. So we're not saying that influence production by societal groups works the same in democracies as it does in autocracies, but that when we take this framework, we can actually learn from comparing across these regime types because we know roughly what to expect in democratic contexts and can compare the results of our case studies with that. And then also we have some chapters that make this comparison directly. So to start then with the first stage of influence production, this is about why and how latent societal interests coalesce into sustainable organizational forms. How do they overcome free rider problems, organizational drifts or member attrition? What we find is that this stage is really the primary bottleneck for lobbying the autocrat, which makes a lot of intuitive sense because of the strict entry controls repression and other management tactics that autocrats use. And because of those, we see fewer and smaller groups that actually mobilize into organizational forms when compared to democracies. Overall, this repression, this menu of repression is aimed at channeling group formation away from those issue spaces where they could result in larger social mobilizations and away from what we call no-go issues. These no-go issues differ from country to country and can sometimes be uh, quite surprising and in um, benign policy issues that we would think at first anyway. I'm happy to go into more details, of course. But at the same time, what we do find is that technical information that advocacy groups can provide about policy implementation, about what is the best policy solution for a given problem? That type of information is actually valued just as much by autocratic governments as it is by democratic ones. Moving on to the second stage, which looks at how organizations survive in an ecology of other advocacy groups that work in the same policy space or on the same issues. What we find is that the density of this ecology, so just how many groups are there working on health or on defense or on trade, that density drives patterns of competition and cooperation of niche seeking and coalition building, just as we would expect in democratic contexts. So that actually travels remarkably well across regime types. However, overall, there is more competition in the autocracies that we look at uh, than we would expect from democracies. And we think that is due to the scarcer resources, harder to get members, harder to get funding, uh, etc. We also observe a bifurcation of this group ecology. Essentially, it is split almost into two separate ecologies of advocacy groups. On the one hand, you have regime aligned groups um, that are subsidized by preferential access that are sanctioned that are that get discursive support through state media and so forth and on the other hand you have autonomous groups that are more challengers to the regime um, and they often suffer the worst repression and they respond by informalizing their structure and trying to form alliances with external actors like transnational advocacy networks how do groups choose their advocacy strategies? Um, how do they select their tactics? Generally, uh, there are very similar group level drivers of strategy choice, which uh, translates again quite well from the interest group literature to our autocratic context. Groups try to find the least cost solution to balance um, the maximization of influence with organizational maintenance and pleasing their members, and at the same time trying to evade repression. So very similar variables predict what strategy groups would choose, be it inside or outside lobbying, appealing to legislators, bureaucrats, and what have you. However, we do find a slightly greater impact of political resources. And by that, we mean um, being embedded 
with the government, for example, receiving government funding, which happens in democracies and autocracies, but it plays a larger role in our authoritarian context, and also being aligned with the opposition. So these political resources have a larger impact on strategy choice. Surprisingly, what we, um, what we, what we found that was against our expectations was that outside lobbying strategies are just as prevalent under authoritarianism which might loop back to the Cambodian advocates trying to appeal to the press uh, despite censorship uh, or self-censorship of the media. Then finally, when and why do groups achieve influence? By that we mean um, achieving access to relevant policy forums or to relevant policymaking actors or uh, achieving preference attainment so that their preference for a policy solution is actually realized. So when and why do groups achieve that influence? What is similar here is that elite disagreement provides key opportunities to advocacy groups. And what they can leverage here is the expert policy information, again, that they possess, that they can then provide to subsidize elites that struggle with other elites in uh, getting their preferred solution through. What is different is that influence is primarily restricted to non-sensitive areas, so not the no-go issues that I mentioned before, uh, and that influence is higher in those areas uh, on which the regime focuses for its core legitimation claims. That could be economic performance, that could be um, nominally democratic procedures or others. Those are the areas where we see more influence. Okay, so this uh, was just a snapshot really of our results, a sneak peek, as I said, but um, to conclude, uh, we would say that there are surprising similarities um, between democracies and autocracies in how societal actors lobby for policy change. What we try to do is to identify some cross-cutting factors that impact on all the four stages of influence production and from that then assemble the building blocks of a theory of lobbying the autocrat and uh, Jessica will now tell you more about that part of our work. Thank you so much. Thanks so much Max. Uh, Jessica, whenever you're ready, go right ahead. Yes, I'm also going to share my screen. So bear with me for just a second. <laughs> there we go. Everybody can see that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pick up where Max stopped and we've actually had a really productive partnership. So I think um, this presentation will, will show that as well. Um, and so what we wanted to try to do was to put together some sort of a research agenda for understanding advocacy under authoritarianism. And the reason that we wanted to do this is as we first started talking about our research and talking with our co-authors, we were really frustrated because we have lots of great case studies looking at advocacy and authoritarian regimes um, where we see successful policy influence. The problem is, is that most of these case studies are pretty isolated. So oftentimes they're single country case studies. They're not really compared to other cases, either in that same country, but at different times or with other countries. So there's sort of a silo of, of learning. We also see that overall, there's just data scarcity in authoritarian regimes, right? That's, that's not unique just to civil society, but we see that um, across all different types of variables. And the other thing that we found that was really problematic in studying the literature um, on advocacy and authoritarian regimes is that even though we know that these groups are active in a whole life cycle, as Max just talked about, usually we only see that people are writing about cases where there's a, su a successful outcome, right? So one where the group wins a policy uh, victory or there's protest or you know a threat to regime change or something like that. So that's what we found in the literature. Um, and so it leads to this literature that's really rich and diverse like Max talked about, but it's pretty isolated and we're not really 
building on all of that learning to come up with any sort of a theory that other people can use. And so we were inspired by the, the sort of institutional turn in comparative authoritarianism. So that really um, robust literature that has tried to take these quasi-democratic institutions like parties or parliaments or elections and explore how they're being used in authoritarian regimes and build out a set of hypotheses and try to develop a stronger theory. And that's what we wanted to do. But instead of looking at elites and institutions, we wanted to look at society and advocacy. So that's what we tried to do. And um, as Max already talked about, we tried to draw from a lot of different types of authoritarian regimes um, and a couple of large N analyses as well. So what we found, and, and Max went through all the findings that we found in the life cycle, but one thing that we found that was important is that there are a lot of differences across this life cycle, right? So if you're studying just, you know, the influence outcome or just the advocacy strategy, you might not actually be seeing what that group is doing throughout this whole life cycle. And so one thing that we found, for example, is that for those first two stages where the groups first start to form and first start to interact with other groups and get funding and, and decide whether they're going to cooperate or if they're going to um, be more conflictual, we see that there are a lot of differences here between authoritarian regimes and democracies. But in those latter two stages, we don't see as many differences. In fact, a lot of the, the group strategies or the types of outcomes they get are very similar to what we see in democracies. And so what's interesting is even though we have the same authoritarian institutions across the whole life cycle, we see variation there. So that was one important thing that we found. The other important thing that we found, and, and this will be sort of echoes of uh, Milan Spolik's dismal conditions, um, but one thing that we found is that there are three main conditions in authoritarian regimes that are pretty unique and actually shape advocacy across all of those four stages. And these are access to policymaking, um, the types of information that are available, and social management strategies. And so I wanted to quickly go through these as far as how we put together what we hope is a theoretical framework. So for this first one, access to policymaking, this is all pretty well known, right? So we just see that authoritarian regimes usually have a more consolidated um, political authority structure. And so there are going to be fewer people who have the authority to make policy. So oftentimes we'll see that there are more local strategies. So groups work at the local level than, rather than the central level. We unexpectedly, as Max pointed out, we see a lot of use of collective action and media publicity simply because they don't have access to policy making. So it's not necessarily a choice, it's the only alternative in some cases. And as Max pointed out, elite splits can help locate access points to policymaking, but this is a pretty dangerous group, uh, game for groups to get involved in because sometimes this can trigger repression. And so what we have as part of our theoretical framework are two areas that we think that future re research needs to address. So one is the size of the policymaking elite. How many um, elites make policy? Where are they located? The central level, the regional level, the local level? Are they in the executive? Are they in the legislature? Are they party elites? Um, and then the second question is about sources of elite policy competition. And this is basically just trying to figure out what sort of group groups um, have different policy preferences in that country. And so what are those policy preferences? So that's the first factor that we look at with these authoritarian regimes. And the second is about information. So as everyone already knows, we see that there's less information um, in authoritarian regimes due to information control and repression. But we also increasingly in hybrid regimes see a group of autocrats who are relying on performance or procedural legitimation claims. These require more information from society. Right. And so here's um, this this new term that uh, was recently published looking at informational autocrats. Right. They need information in order to meet these legitimation claims. And so based on this finding, we argue that future scholarship should look at these two questions about information demand. One is about the availability of this information. So are we seeing that elite competition like, let's say, in elections is producing information? Is there some sort of need? 
media presence, or what are the channels that this sort of information can be collected from society. And then also looking at the need. So a number of our case studies found that um, certain types of regimes needed political information about society and satisfaction. Some regimes um, needed more technical information, like those with complex economies. And there were also other regimes that didn't have the capacity to deliver necessary services. And so they were actually looking for information about service delivery. And then in the last area of social control or repression, this is such an important factor, right? So this is showing up in all of the cases that we're looking at. We're seeing that repression is influencing all four stages of interest production. And also that this, the way that repression happens is actually pretty diverse. So it's not just people being jailed or something like that. Instead, there are lots of, um, if you want to think about it as, as soft forms of repression, I don't know if repression can be soft, but softer forms of repression maybe. And these are, I've listed out a couple of examples here, but these are things like surveillance. Um, there are oftentimes fabricated crimes like tax fraud. So all sorts of threats that can be brought against um, advocacy groups to make sure sure that they are, you know, playing by the rules. And so given this constant presence of repression, both hard and soft repression, we argue that future research needs to address these two questions. One is looking at the repression repertoire. So how repressive are social management practices? How much space is there? Are, is repression targeted or is it pretty much just against any advocacy group? And then what kind of opportunities are there to work with either government partners or these transnational advocacy networks? And then the policy red lines, where are these policy uh, no-go areas? Like in China, we always say that it's you know Tibet, Taiwan, and Xinjiang, but you can talk about other things. So are there a couple of policy no-go areas? How stable are these? Do these red lines shift all the time or are they grouped around, you know, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Taiwan? And then what sort of regime legitimation claims do we see? And we argue that what, what we're seeing is that we're, those authoritarian institutions are not acting the same way all across the, the interest production life cycle. We see differences there, and so it's important to disaggregate what groups are doing. We also argue that um, these three conditions that we outlined can generate testable hypotheses around access information and repression, and that this can then be used to pull together all of these single country case studies or large end analyses so that we're all working from a common research agenda. We have expectations, we have testable hypotheses, and then we can compare our findings. One thing that's really important that we also found, as Max already talked about, is that the space is bifurcated. So when we're talking about adv advocacy groups or if we want to talk about civil society, we're not necessarily seeing that there's one civil society or one advocacy community. Instead, we're seeing that there's probably two with very distinct ecologies and that access information and repression are working differently in those two different spaces. And the last thing that we wanted to point out that we found with our research um, for, for future scholars is that we see that these advocates, the ones who are successful, are adaptive or pragmatic, right? And so we see a lot of flexibility throughout the life cycle. We don't necessarily see that one group picks one strategy or they talk about an issue using a certain framing and they don't deviate from that. Instead, we see that the groups are really responsive to coming across red lines or changing political opportunity structures and that they really adapt to that. And so that's something that's really important to know is that these groups are going to vary not only across the life cycle, but also maybe in the frames that they use and the strategies that they use. And so that's why we think it's important to study these groups throughout a life cycle in a more holistic way, and then also try to link up with this, this um, theoretical framework. I don't want to call it a theory, but a theoretical framework that we started to create that we hope will allow people to see what maybe is expected out of their case and what's unique and needs to be explored more. Um, and I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A um, session about how my research on China corresponds with what we found. But these are our overall macro findings.
Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks, Max and Jessica, for giving that great overview of a really ambitious and important project. And now let's get into some get into some cases. Um, and so we're going to start with uh, with Sasha Devogel. Hey, thanks, Dan, and thank you for inviting me to uh, serve as the guest editor for this issue. Um, it is a really interesting newsletter. Um, and everyone should uh, check it out. There's a lot of um, contributions from Max and Jessica's book that are just in a short form, really easy to digest, um, and I highly recommend it. Um, hopefully this will work. Okay. Um, so my work is on Russia, um, and specifically I work on um, collective action that involves a protest component. So I'm just going to talk about some of these movements that I've studied in Moscow and some of the tactics that they're using to advocate for these policy specific concerns that they have and look at a little bit of the data that I have about how the state responds to them and their longer term influence on policy. So um, I look at these, I call them everyday protests. These are protest campaigns that are about specific policy issues. Um, so they're not about these high level um, political issues like political liberalization, human rights, democracy, or transformative social economic demands. Um, they're about very specific policies that they want the government to change. Now, usually when we think about collective action um, that involves protests and autocracies, we think of these really adversarial state society relations, these active conflicts where protesters on one side are using protests to create disruption that really interferes with the status quo, and that gives them leverage to sort of compel the state to make changes um, to policy or politics um, in line with what they demand. And the state, on the other hand, uses repression we usually think of, um, we're talking about autocracies, repression is a sort of go-to strategy to try to end that disruption and they only make concessions if it's sort of a last resort. This is a simplification of how we usually think about um, protest dynamics. When we look at these everyday protests, we see something a little bit different. So I'm gonna dig into that here. So again, these are policy oriented demands. Um, they therefore need the government to retain the power to determine policy and enforce policy and other things like court judgments and things of that nature. So they're sort of fundamentally not threatening on that level. And this opens the space for other government responses. Um, in the data that I've collected, which is about protest campaigns directed to the city government of Moscow. So these are protests about um, issues that the city government has the authority to resolve. Um, the, these campaigns um, are pretty low capacity in general. Um, this is another sort of avenue by which they're not really directly threatening the government. They're also not quite the same as the advocacy organizations that Jessica and Max are talking about um, in that they're kind of maybe a level of organization below that. A lot of these campaigns, it would be a stretch to call them organized. It's For some of them, it's just a group of people, you know, running a Facebook group, essentially. Um, and they're certainly far below the level of a social movement. So on average, the campaigns I collected data for hold 12 events over the course of five years. Um, they get 200 people per mass event on average. Um, the range there is pretty big, um, but there were only a few campaigns of the 66 that I have data on that managed to get more than 1,000 people at their demonstrations on a regular basis, or at least once. Um, and for context, Moscow has a population of 12 million people, um, and the metropolitan area has a population of 20 million people, so 1,000 is quite low. Um, they're getting 30 people at their other types of events. These are things like pickets or um, hunger strikes and things like that. They're generally not working with political parties. Um, and the types of issues that they're about are sort of construction. These are kind of like not in my backyard construction issues, labor disputes, and the provision of social services are pretty common issues. Um, so we're going to look quickly at the kinds of tactics that they're using. Um, to be included in this data set, these campaigns had to hold at least one protest, so at least one demonstration or rally. So that number is 100% of the campaigns have held one of those events. Um, the other two, the two other top three most common types of events are these events that are about conveying information to the state. So um, we have here mass complaints were um, organized by just over 50% of these campaigns. These are events where they show up at a government office um, and in person file complaints or like fill out forms conveying information to the state about their grievance. And then we have also petitions and letters. These were uh, our uh, signature collection campaigns, letter writing campaigns, 
um, open letters sometimes, and these were used by about 70% of campaigns. And again, this is a tactic about informing the state about your grievance. I also see a really high number of these campaigns or a high percentage of these campaigns are directly appealing to the executive. So they're appealing to the mayor of Moscow, Sergei Sivyanin, or directly to Vladimir Putin. This is a very, very popular tactic in Russia. So filing complaints at their offices specifically or writing them letters specifically. And now the kinds of information that they're conveying in these tactics are really sort of two types. Um, in some cases, it's about the existence of the grievance. So this usually occurs when the grievance pertains to some kind of like violations, so like criminal activity or like a violation of a policy that should be in effect. So something like the non-payment of wages. Um, the second type really pertains to public opinion information um, that citizens are unhappy with the policy that the government is pursuing. Um, and I have work uh, elsewhere that shows that in the former case, when it's about sort of a grievance, the, um, like a violation of a policy, the city actually wants that information and reacts to it sort of positively. Um, and when it's inf information about public opinion, this is not particularly desired information by the city of Moscow, and they get quite different um, responses from um, that kind of information. Oh, sorry, again, just to emphasize, these are not really tactics about disrupting the status quo. These are tactics about communicating with the government, um, which is quite a different type of um, sort of orientation than these um, highly politicized protests um, that we see sort of getting big headlines are using. Okay, so now I'm gonna look quickly at state responses. So I have some um, information about repression here. I collected information about, I think around 10 or 15 um, forms of repression. And these are just some of the most common. Um, so of the 66 campaigns, about 20% um, were subject to a counter protest or the destruction of property of protesters by the police. Um, about a third of them experienced a conflict with non-state actors. These are usually um, private security forces, um, biker gangs, and orthodox religious thugs. Um, about 38% of them um, had the leaders detained. So a specific organizer of the protest detained um, at least once. And um, about 50%, just under 50%, had some kind of other, other detention. 60% um, of these campaigns, the most common form of repression, um, were these warnings. And this is actually not even a cue to disperse a protest. It's just sort of the police saying, like, if you guys keep doing this, you know, it might be, uh, might get kind of awkward, sort of. They're really um, a very, very light form of protest. So in comparison, we have these sort of conciliatory or concessionary responses. Um, these top four categories are statements from various members of government that recognize the grievance or acknowledge it in some way, um, recognize that people are upset about it. Um, they're not exactly promising a solution to it, but they're sort of saying, you know, we see that you're, you're having an issue. Um, maybe we're gonna look into it or something like that. Um, Putin and Sabyanin are not um, super inclined to make these statements, but members of the city government really are. And over half of these campaigns receive some kind of encouraging um, response from um, a city official. 77% of these campaigns hold a meeting um, or attend a meeting with um, a member, usually of the city government, um, in the course of these five years. And this is quite striking because this is actually more, um, a much higher percentage of campaigns and even received a um, sort of a light warning in the course of a protest. Um, and this is particularly striking if you study Russia, it's usually not considered a very responsive regime. It's not considered a system that's friendly to protest. And then we see here that they're actually working with protesters and sort of um, acknowledging or even um, uh, sort of encouraging them in some cases. And then finally, we have concessions. So concessions, this is really the focus of my research. Um, concessions were made to 44 campaigns. And again, that's higher than the percentage of campaigns that received a warning. The city government made 122 concessions in the five years that I looked at, and that is on average one concession every two weeks, um, which again is quite shocking for a regime that is not considered responsive to protest. However, when we think about concessions and we think about the influence of protest on policies, we have to look beyond just the promise of the concession and look at what kind of influence it's actually having um, on policy, on politics, on these grievances over time, because we know that these statements from authoritarian officials where we don't have elections that really function as they should um, are really not binding. 
Um, and particularly in these cases, these very low capacity protest campaigns, they don't really retain necessarily the ability to continue to hold these protests. So I'm gonna dig into these concessions a little more and try to look at that. So here I've just broken them up into the kind of type of promise that the um, government official is making. We have concessions of recognition. This is just sort of um, promising to hold meetings in the future or set up committees and things like that. Um, holding an investigation, um, implementing a reform. So implementing a formal change to policy. Distribution of material or financial goods. That's usually um, paying back wages. It's not um, sort of paying people to stop protest. Um, it's related to the, to the grievance. Um, and then enforcement, which is about sort of the application of policy, determining, you know, to what extent a policy should apply in a situation, things like that. So if we're looking at the long term consequences of protests and concessions, we really want to look at these formal policy changes, because that's going to be the most enduring kind of, um, of change resulting from this activity. We see that it's not a huge percentage of the concessions. It's just under 15 percent. So they're kind of hesitant to make these make these types of concessions. I'm going to look now at the implementation of these concessions over time. Um, this is a little bit of a confusing graph, but um, what we have here is I researched each of these 122 concessions um, in six or seven periods quarterly for the first year after the concession was promised, and then yearly after that. Um, and I assessed the level of implementation, so the extent to which they were actually affecting real world policy behavior. Um, sort of on the ground um, situation um, with these grievances. So I want to draw your attention to this top sort of quadrant, this lightest blue. These are the concessions that had no effect on real world policy and behavior. Um, these accounted for around 45% of the concessions that were promised any, in any given period. So a really significant share of these promises are never affecting um, anything about uh, real world policy. They're not affecting the grievance in any way. Um, one second, sorry. Um, if you can't see the graph, can you? I can't tell. Oh, well, sorry, one second. I only just saw these messages that apparently you can't see it. Can you see it now? Okay, sorry about that. Well, let's uh, look at this again quickly. <laughs> so this is the data about um, uh, the implementation. So you can see that this top category here over these seven periods that I looked at, these are the concessions that had no influence on policy, um, the ones that I would say the government fully redigged on. Um, so at any given time, that's about 45% of all concessions that were made um, to these protesters. Um, however, by the same token, we do have a pretty good share of concessions that were fully implemented, um, at least certainly at the within the first year and particularly in the first three months. So this is this bottom darkest blue quadrant um, in the first couple of months after the concessions promised about um, just over a third of those are actually in effect and that kind of declines over time. Um, I will quickly show you this data just so you can see the distribution of um, um, concessions by the type of promise. Um, I'm going to go a little bit over time. Sorry about that. So um, most of these concessions are about enforcement and distribution. And then we have reform, as I said, is about 15%. So breaking this renegging or implementation data out by those types of um, policies, um, I just want to draw your attention to the reform concessions. So that's 15% about enduring policy change, legal changes to the law that are going to have effect into the future. Um, you can see there's a very good percentage of these. It's about 50% within the first year have no effect on policy. So the government does literally nothing, um, in some cases, um, literally nothing to implement those policy changes in any way. On the other hand, there is quite a large share of these concessions that are implemented within the first year. And yet we see that decline in the years after, um, after that concession is made. So we have sort of a two kind of strategies here using these reform um, concessions where either they're just sort of a diversionary tactic um, and they're reneged on right away, or they're implemented and then the state kind of claws it back over time. 
So to conclude, um, so we have these everyday um, policy-oriented protest campaigns that are working to convey information um, to the autocratic government. In some, case, the, in some cases, the government wants that information. And in some cases, it is not particularly desirous of that information. Um, however, in response to these campaigns, the government engages in acknowledgement as well as concessions in addition to repression. However, few of those concessions actually relate to lasting policy reforms and due to reneging, even fewer of them actually influence policies over time. So this is potentially an avenue by which citizens can influence policy, but the prevalence of reneging really kind of undermines um, the power of these protests. And again, I apologize for the issue with the slides. Um, if you wanna email me, I will send you the slides. <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. And that's, that's a great example of why you should verbally explain what's in your in your images as well as just showing them because it made so much. It was perfectly clear. It was perfectly great. Even we couldn't see the images changing. So it was it was terrific. <laughs> Thanks so much for showing that really, really fantastic research you've been doing. Um, and now we're going to go over to uh, Manfred Elfstrom will be next bringing us to, to China and the role of labor there. Great. I uh, hope everyone can see my slides fine. I, I want to add my voice to others and thanking everyone who worked to make this panel possible. Um, my book concerns a group workers, uh, that at least in the country I study, China, is not as well organized as the groups discussed by the other panelists, uh, maybe even Sasha's, and uh, other contributors to the newsletter special issue, such as environmental NGOs or business lobbyists and business people turned politicians. Nonetheless, as my title suggests, I argue in the volume that labor is profoundly altering the Chinese state from below, albeit in a contradictory manner. I begin the book with a pair of anecdotes. The first dates to April uh, 2004. At that time, thousands of workers went on strike and protested at two shoe factories, Xingang and Xingxiong, uh, both owned by the Taiwanese firm Stella International. It ended up taking public security, aided by 30 factory guards, three hours to restore order. Afterward, the police detained dozens of workers and put 10 of them on trial. <clears throat> but things didn't end there. Labor groups um, based outside mainland China placed pressure on the multinational sourcing from Stella, urging leniency. Moreover, the renowned human rights lawyer uh, Gao Zhisheng agreed to take the accused workers' case and gave a stirring speech in their defense. The outcome, although the workers were initially convicted, they were acquitted on appeal. Fast forward a little over a decade. In 2015, angry that Stella had not made legally required payments into a housing fund, over a thousand employees at Xingang and Xingxiong once more took to the streets. This time, the Chinese state seemed a lot better prepared. Photos of the 2015 protests show hundreds of riot police lined up in neat formation, kettling workers within the factory grounds. Lawyer Gao, who gave the dramatic defense in 2004, had long since disappeared into prison, then been released, then disappeared again. Foreign groups had less political room to advocate for the strikers, and multinational social compacts had been scaled back. Labor's options had seemingly been significantly reduced since the last showdown. However, authorities had also become more willing to meet workers halfway, doubtless under pressure from the government to do its part to maintain social stability. Stella quickly conceded to employee demands, paying the workers their housing subsidy in cash. And a year later, when the Xingang factory shut down entirely, Management went above and beyond what was required by law and generously compensated employees avoiding another standoff. Thus, from another perspective, labor was in a much better position than before. So what, I ask, changed in the years between the two incidents? The short answer I give is that workers from all over China, but especially in the country southeast where Xingang and Xingxiong were located, began taking to the streets. Although official Chinese strike statistics aren't available, unofficial counts, uh, including those of China Labor Bulletin, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and my own China Strikes data set, which I rely upon throughout the book and at various points in this presentation, show a dramatic upward trajectory in workplace conflicts over the course of the early 21st century. The result of all this contention I posit is that Chinese governance 
was profoundly altered in the years between the two Sulla strikes and continues to be altered today, uh, but again, in a contradictory manner. Most of the book is dedicated to tracing the bottom up process by which I assert this change has taken place. The process, I argue, stretches all the way from dusty shop floors to the halls of power. And the process looks like this. First, you have various combinations of economic sectors and worker demographics that I dub uh, recipes for resistance. These generate different forms of resistance. These forms of resistance then bump up against state officials' bureaucratic incentives. Central government in China is intensely concerned about stability, and this concern is transmitted level by level down to local officials in the form of pressures to demonstrate to their superiors that they're on top of things when conflict rises. Demonstrating competence yields distinct regional models of control, different models for different forms of resistance. These models add up on average uh, to increase state repressive capacity on the one hand and state responsive capacity on the other. And in the end, I argue, you have a lurching warped form of political development. Let's take this process one step at a time, uh, beginning with the different recipes for resistance. Certain factors tend to coincide with higher worker militancy. You can see here, for example, how strikes cluster in counties uh, with higher migrant worker populations, the darker shaded counties in the slide. I show that in places like this, and in sectors like light industry, construction, and transportation, there's more of what I call uh, transgressive, and borrowing from Kevin O'Brien, boundary-spanning resistance. In contrast, in places with higher tech, higher value added industries and more local workers, you see more contained resistance. Next, these different forms of resistance meet the bureaucratic incentives felt by grassroots cadres to demonstrate to their superiors that they're on top of things. Interviews I've conducted show the extraordinary pressure that unrest places on individual local officials. In the interest of time, I won't read you these quotes here. But it's worth emphasizing that such pressure isn't just some sort of free-floating anxiety like that captured by my interviews. It comes with real career consequences. Here you can see, for example, that membership turnover on the Politics and Law Committee responsible for stability maintenance in Shenzhen, a leading city in the strike-prone Pearl River Delta, has been higher than turnover in the Politics and Law Committee of Suzhou in the relatively calm Yangtze River Delta. Given the sort of churn and personnel, bureaucrats in contentious places have strong reasons to signal to hires up uh, that they're doing all they can to keep the situation under control. And the various actions taken congeal into distinct regional modes of control. I demonstrate how in the Yangtze River Delta, where rest generally takes the form of contained or at most uh, boundary spanning resistance, the approach pursued by authorities can be characterized as preemption, caution, and nudging, or what I call an orthodox model of control. While in the Pearl River Delta, where unrest takes a boundary spanning to outright transgressive form, the approach can be characterized as reaction, experimentation, and crackdowns, or what I call risk, a risk-taking model of control. More specifically, Jiangsu officials carefully monitor workplaces, nipping burgeoning disputes in the bud, but only pass the most incremental labor laws that simply tweak national policies while allowing their branches of the state controlled trade union federation to focus on old state socialist era welfare functions. Businesses are prodded into line with things like a harmonious enterprises initiative and labor NGOs are given government office space and steered away from sensitive issues. In contrast, in Guangdong, officials don't try to head off each and every conflict. There are just too many of them for them to try that. Instead, in recent years, they've passed pioneering labor laws. They've come close to recognizing a right to strike, and they've contemplated, but not passed, laws that would insert workers into core corporate decisions. Especially since 2010, the region has supported direct elections for the heads of enterprise level unions, something long mandated by law, but rarely implemented. Uh, and it's conducted exercises that come close to approximating real collective bargaining. 
At the same time, the Guangdong government has come down hard on labor NGOs, jailing leading activists for extended periods. Ordinary strikers, particularly high profile incidents, are increasingly beaten and detained. These regional models of control then add up with a long-term result of more repressive and responsive capacity. As you can see, changes in strikes at a provincial level are positively and significantly correlated with changes in people's armed police spending, measuring repressive capacity, as well as changes in pro-worker and split decisions in mediation, arbitration, and court, by measuring responsive capacity. Meanwhile, there's no significant relationship with pro-business decisions. So closing up, what are some of the broader implications of the book? My findings uh, echo those of our other panelists today. Uh, first, uh, contradicting both the transitology and resilience paradigms in research on authoritarianism, which both treat the state as relatively fixed, either as unable to adapt and, there, adapt and therefore on the verge of collapse or as some sort of omniscient puppet master, I show that day-to-day -day change in autocratic rule is real and worth studying. Social movements have an impact outside of autocracies, outside of democracies. Broad shifts in governance, not just uh, individual wins and losses are observable, and autocracies are maybe best understood as nesting regimes inside regimes. Protest builds the state, uh, but also perhaps uh, warps it. Maybe most basically, my book uh, cautions against overly uh, linear understandings of political change, and it leaves reasons for both optimism and pessimism for uh, supporters of Chinese labor. I'll leave it right there, and thanks so much, and look forward to the discussion. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much, Manfred. Um, and finally, we'll have uh, David Zaccone talking about his book and his research on, uh, on Russia. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I'm going to try to share my whole screen. Okay. How's that working? It's good. Good. Okay. So I will be really quick. So we have time for uh, questions and answers. But yeah, I'm going to talk about my, my book that came out last year. Uh, actually, two years now since we're in January, Politics for Profit business elections and policymaking in Russia. So the motivation is pretty, pretty straightforward. We, over the last 100 years, even longer, I mean, there's historical data showing that you know, business people are one of the most common professions to run and win elected office worldwide. Um, here's some recent examples. All three men are obviously out of office, although Petro Poroshenko parachuted into Ukraine a couple of weeks ago and may be trying to, to return. But you, you, know, you can think of numerous examples around the world um, of businessmen and businesswomen uh, running for national executive office, serving as prime minister, serving as president, um, and, and often China's touting their professional experience as one of their main kind of assets um, in terms of what they bring to, to public office. And the situation is really similar in, in parliaments, and this is kind of a a bad cross-section of some data that I could find from countries around the world, both democracies, but especially autocracies, you see Oftentimes a plurality of parliamentarians, of deputies, claiming to have business of background as their, um, as their primary kind of professional trait as they, as they submit their registration forms or they actually, their biographies when they serve in office. So in some places like Bangladesh, almost two thirds of the parliament has that type of background. But even, you know, Central Asian and, and other post-Soviet countries, looking at a third or a little less than a third of people running for office having this background. And, you know, the study of, that I'm going to talk about is, is broadly about business people and, and what this demographic characteristic means for understanding politics. But obviously, a lot of the cases that I talk about in the book and, and, and Russia, for, for sure, it's, are going to be autocracy. So I'm going to try to connect this research as much as possible to the very interesting presentations that preceded me. So the book is really built around two main questions, and I'll, I'll kind of go through how I, how I approach these questions and what kind of hopefully original answers I come up with them. But the first is kind of from a broadly political science standpoint, why would business people ever run for elected office? Um, you know, putting egos aside and ambition and, you know, trying to do something different with your lives. There's a lot of reasons why we would be surprised by business people hanging up their their reins in the in the corporate world and turning to politics because 
politics is nasty. Politics brings a lot of scrutiny, a lot of media attention, re potential reputational damage. Um, and it's unclear what the payoff is unless you have that ego. Um, and it also costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of time. And it's not clear that you can just walk away from your business empire and do two jobs at the same time. And, you know, that kind of is one of the many motivations for this puzzle is why are so many business people running for elected office um, around the world? Because when there are so many different types of constraints and reasons why we might not expect them to populate these institutions as much as they do, especially considering there are so many professional politicians and lawyers and people that have been spending their entire career grooming themselves for this moment, the idea of business people parachuting in after a long career in the corporate world is somewhat surprising, especially at the numbers that we see. And to connect this really squarely into the, the lobbying discussion that's been brought up so many times so far is, you know, I try to articulate in the book that interest groups in general and business in firms being one of many interest groups can select between kind of direct and indirect political strategies for in, for influencing you know, institutions and decision making. You know, in the indirect side, we've talked about this. So, you know, you can lobby, you can make campaign contributions, you can approach the regulators, you can mobilize and protest and do a lot of things to try to get politicians' attention and so that they advocate on your behalf. A direct strategy is which really what I talk about in the book is when you say, you know, the politicians are great, we we can work through them, but I'd rather become the politician directly and occupy office um, and, and kind of bypass that intermediary. So indirect is when you kind of lobby or kind of work through a politician and direct is when you become the politician and occupy that space. And that's the central question of the book is why would any interest group, and I talk about companies specifically, why would they choose a direct strategy that's way costlier and requires kind of formal participation over an indirect one where you just kind of pay an upfront cost and then maybe arrange some kind of exchange and then you can go about your other business without having to actually occupy that political position. And the, the crux of the argument is that politicians, especially in weakly institutionalized societies, especially in autoc autocracies, are really untrustworthy intermediaries. And I try to give a, as many examples as I can of politicians extorting interest groups, extorting firms, extorting civil society groups, promising one thing and then going the other way. And the most egregious examples is they flee the country with a lot of money that they've extorted um, with their families and are on the run. But it happens often enough that there are just dozens, if not hundreds of criminal cases against politicians in Russia for, for treating interest groups badly. And what I'd argue is that these interest groups internalize this and they say, well, why would I pay the cost of an indirect strategy when directly holding office solves this commitment problem? So the argument is that business people run for office because politicians and the political environment is not giving them what they're wanting from that kind of market exchange standpoint. And the only way to, to fix the situation is to go around the intermediaries and directly hold elected office. And I argue that there's things like weak political parties and really strong competition that exacerbate that commitment problem, make it more likely that the autocrat and his or her delegates and cadres are gonna defect and shirk and treat interest groups badly. And then because of that, this direct route into politics is seen as an alternative avenue in order to get influence um, and, and access the political sphere. So it's really about untrustworthiness and shirking that are driving um, some of these decisions. The second half of the book is like, okay, we have now this really huge, powerful interest group that is occupying a third of seats in parliaments and sometimes national elected office. What do business people actually do in office? What, what, how does this group wield its political influence? And when it's actually there, what kind of policies does it push for? Um, so the second half of the book asks this on two different dimensions. The first is at the firm level. So I, I use a lot of data and try to show that a business person serving in a regional legislature in Russia does wonders for his or her firm. Um, over the course of one term in office, their revenue increases by about 60% and the overall firm profitability about about 15%. So this is on the back of access to state contracts and procurement opportunities. So they're using this direct access to politicians or by becoming a politician by a lot of the other discussions, debates, information networks um, to, to access a new source of revenue from the state and a less competitive basis that is really, really handsomely rewarding um, for the, the shareholders, especially the directors of the firms. 
But then taking a step back, well, what does this mean for the rest of us? Well, the more business people you have in office at the regional level or in the mayoral level, um, the more spending you get on things that business cares about. So that this type of political strategy is really pays off not only for an individual firms, but for the entire business community. And you get more spending on infrastructure, you get lower corporate taxes, while you get less spending on social social items such as health care and education and other things that citizens really care about, according to surveys, um, the business community really neglects. So they're getting into office and helping themselves and by, by capturing these type of political institutions. I don't want to talk too much about how I try to show all these things. It's I, I, it definitely is weighted more towards the quantitative data analysis, but to show a lot of this, I focus on Russia over the last um, decade and a half, um, where there's been about a third, a little over a third of members of regional legislatures, which is the equivalent of states in, in Russia that have a business background. But I'm gonna collect, I collected data on over 40,000 candidates to, to regional legislatures, as well as almost 70,000 candidates to mayoral office. So this is about, as, as broad of a subnational analysis as you can undertake. And Russia is really neat in this sense because there are so many subnational units that help power the analysis. I'm gonna supplement that with balance sheets for about 3 million companies, uh, as well as about a million procurement contracts and 25,000 municipal budget. So it's a, it's a hefty, hefty poll, but overall the data kind of comes in and out to show not only why business people and what type of business people choose this direct form of strategy, but also what they get from office. But, you know, I, I did travel to Russia and live in Russia for a long time throughout all this and worked in, in, in three Russian regions and did about 70 semi-structured interviews to talk with these people and get their get their takes and kind of supplement, but also kind of drive the, the, the theoretical framework um, for this. So how does this all tie into, you know, the whole discussion for this for the for this panel, well, yeah, I think the four things where the book kind of makes a contribution, hopefully, to how lobbying under autocracy works, and you know, in generally how 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 autocrats govern. And the first is that you know, weak institutions and weak parties prompt interest groups to develop really creative solutions to gain political influence. And we see a lot of things, and I show this in a couple other different types of projects that I've worked on, is that interest groups and firms and other types of organizations. I've really innovated um, in autocracies to, in order to gain attention and to get their ideas forward and circumvent a lot of the problems that are endemic to autocratic institutions. And this is one real example that if you can't bargain effectively, if you can't hammer out agreements with politicians, then you can go around politicians with some ease um, and then get on their level and then they kind of force them to listen to you. And I think that's, it's, it's a really kind of illustrative example of that creativity. The second is there's some work in autocracy really where the everything flows downward, where the government controls all of the economic policy making and sends out dictates and it's, you know, approximately some kind of command economy and firms fall in line according to what the autocrat wants. Well, I mean, there's a lot of evidence in my book that it's actually many times the other way around, especially in the level of government that you look at, where the firms are capturing the executive and legislative branches, and especially in this third point, and they're using elections to do so. And that that kind of flips the script a little bit, where it's not just lobbying the autocrat, but the, the, the interest groups are now embedded within the autocratic institution and, and kind of manipulating it and, and shaping it to their own um, very specific needs and desires. So that's a, a kind of a different way of thinking about, whereas the autocrat is even on the same level playing field as many of the interest groups and sometimes subservient to these businesses that are driving political activity. And of course, this is where it really differs from China and some of the other cases that have been mentioned where it's all about elections in this story because Russia still has elections up and down the chain. There's this competitive drive where it, you know, a lot of times the political environment feels like a marketplace where there's businesses competing in terms of production and sales outside of politics, but then they're competing for the goodies and the subsidies and the licenses in the access in type of politics. So they're thinking about political institutions under autocracy, the same type of competitive drive that you would have of a wider marketplace, I think in some settings really makes sense. And then finally, when we think about what type of policies we get from autocracies, you know, description, descriptive representation really matters. It, it matters the type of elites that, that personify and then occupy these positions, what where they're coming from, what their personal interests and desires are, because a lot of times accountability is 
weak and there's fewer ways that the general public can constrain elites from just pushing what they personally want um, on politics. And I think I, I showed a variety of evidence that it makes sense to, you know, this is tried at this point to unpack the black box or whatever it is in autocracy and see who's actually inside. But in this case, the more professional experience you have in the business world, the more politics is going to shift in that direction, at least into the cases in, that I study. So go rent your or borrow your book from your local library, considering how expensive academic books are these days. And um, I look forward to a really healthy discussion about the many, many interesting points that have been raised during this panel. Hey, speaking of profit, making some book sales on the, uh, on, on ah, the day. That's for the business people. I'm just <laughs> you, that, that, that's right. right. In, in business. All right. Well, this is terrific, guys. Um, we've still got about 20 minutes and I encourage everyone. Uh, we got a nice, nice audience. Good crowd. Uh, I encourage everyone to go ahead and ask questions in the Q&A and I will I will curate those. Um, let me go ahead and start us off with a, with a question from uh, Deanna Kohlberg from our own Department of Political Science here at Michigan. Um, and she's got a question for, for Max, although I think it's a lot of people might be able to, to speak to it. So Deanna's wondering if, uh, if Max and Jessica find any effect of foreign funding and foreign trading, foreign training, excuse me, uh, for these advocate organizations in authoritarian regimes. And Dion says that she's not so surprised to see similarities between democracies and autocracies, given how much foreign donor funding is in this space. So I guess I would say, just to sort of think about, first of all, the question of how does the how does funding itself play into it, whether foreign or otherwise? Um, what kind of, you know, how does that fit into the picture? Uh, maybe in some ways bringing in the some of the thoughts from, from, from David's final analysis here, right? How does the funding, um, possibly shape some of these four processes. Uh, and then in particular, um, any kind of foreign influence, um, either whether it's funding or training, does that, is that a parameter we should be bringing in here? I can uh, go ahead and, uh, and speak to this just, just very briefly. Thanks so much for the question. Um, it's something that we're not measuring uh, systematically, but of course this comes up a lot in the case studies. Uh, I mean, as, as the first response, I would say that foreign funding is primarily an issue uh, for cause groups or in our context for one side of this bifurcated uh, advocacy group ecology more than for the other side. So it's really the autonomous or oppositional groups first and foremost that need to rely on this foreign funding. Uh, and they also at the same time, of course, face all these foreign agent laws um, that exist in, in most of the countries that we look at. So um, on one side of the uh, on, on one side of the ecology, it's foreign funding that then certainly does have an influence on how advocacy groups operate and specifically on how they choose their strategy. So this is one of the findings that comes out in the book. Um, donors require, you know, certain sort of returns on their investment, and that includes uh, that whoever they fund shows up in the media, that you can show that our money is resulting in concrete action. So that drives advocacy groups to, uh, we hypothesize, towards outside lobbying and media strategies, um, even if those strategies might not be successful in policy influence, they demonstrate to donors that we are doing something. Um, that's actually a, a finding uh, that comes through there. But then on the flip side, on the other side of the uh, bifurcated ecology is actually government funding that plays a similar role. So we have these two sources of funding that, um, that drive dynamics on the two opposite sides of uh, of the group ecology. And as I mentioned in my presentation, these are the political resources that are quite potent in explaining the choice of, um, of advocacy strategy. And then, um, so finally, maybe uh, I would also say or question whether, um, whether foreign funding overall is really that prevalent or if it is just that we first and foremost think about democracy assistance. In our framework, that's actually a tiny proportion of the whole group system. So the teachers association, or let's say the association of, of pencil producers are not getting foreign funding um, from USAID. Um, of course, the election monitors that I showed in my slide, they do. Um, so it's a, it's not, it's a, it's a 
it's a story that needs to be uh, disaggregated. And by like looking at the broader spectrum of group types, I think we can then actually pinpoint which of them are influenced by which type of funding, be it government or foreign. And I would also add to that, if, if that's okay, Dan. Yeah, yeah please, of course, I, of course. I would also add to that, um, that this is slightly um, a historical question in that until probably like 2016, 2017, we do see that there's a lot of foreign funding of advocacy groups and authoritarian regimes. But because of the concerns that were raised in the question that this was sort of a new influence or maybe a Trojan horse for democratization, most of these regimes have changed their legal structure so that it's really challenging to fund these groups. And even if they haven't changed the law, so like in, in China in 2017, you know, they passed the overseas NGO law and it really restricts foreign funding for local groups. But even in countries that haven't changed their laws to restrict that funding, for the groups, if they're going to take money or align themselves with these foreign interests, it sort of paints a target on their back where they can be characterized as, you know, not loyal or acting as an agent for a foreign government. So a lot of groups are also choosing not to take that funding, even if it is available. That was sort of what I was going to, my reaction was going to be as a bit surprised by, by Max's answer to the extent that you would think that a lot of foreign funding would be trying to keep a lower profile, what might be trying to be more focused on some of these you know, meat and potatoes, like governance kinds of questions to get some real tangible results. And so it maybe doesn't paint foreign funders in the in the best light if they're maybe pushing for more confrontation, more more headlines, more attention grabbing, but maybe not as much uh, efficacy as um, you know some of the, the kind of things that you guys show where advocacy can really work in other sorts of areas, especially these kind of technical professional you know areas. So there's sort of a there's a, it's a kind of calls foreign funders into an interesting, you know, and their strategies into question in an interesting way, which is great. It really does. And I think that that's sort of if you look at, you know, Samantha Powers and USAID and their sort of search for a new identity right now, that's exactly what they're addressing, which is, you know, how do we fund groups abroad that are doing really good governance work that we want to see more of in a way that doesn't target them by their governments. And so, you know, she's calling her strategy localization and trying to fund the work that groups are doing at lower levels and not trying to have this sort of political advocacy role. But I think you're right that it's sort of this, it's this real challenge for foundations and, and other funders. Terrific. Okay, next I wanna to try to put a couple of questions together here from uh, Marina Eppelman and from, uh, from Adam Casey. Um, and I think a lot of you can speak to the, the questions being asked here. So what, what Marina asks is about, and this really speaks to, to Sasha's presentation in a lot of ways, but she asks how long lived these policy changes tend to be when they're achieved through, through lobbying. Um, and does it really matter like for its longevity, like how it was, how it was achieved, what kind of organization advocated for it? Obviously Sasha's work on reneging speaks to that. Um, but in, in addition to the question of longevity, um, Adam raises the question of escalation. Um, and so to, when do we see and how much do each of you guys see uh, that, you know, lobbying for, you know, pressure for, in Manfred's case, protest for, in David's case, you know, trying to gain direct access for certain kind of lower level um, changes and, and, and rent seeking and what have you, um, how often do we see this kind of spiral escalate? Um, or to what degree do we think that these you know, autocratic regimes are able to keep a keep a lid on things, um, basically give, you know, essentially give an, an inch to prevent people from from taking a yard. Does anyone from any of their uh, research want to take a crack at that? I can uh, comment on that. Um, so I don't focus on lobbying uh, in the quite same way as some of the other panelists do, but I will say um, in regards to what sort of one of the big influences on the extent to which the government reneges on some of the concessions that I observed, it really relates to whether or not the information conveyed by the protest was something that the government struggled to gain information about otherwise. And that's actually pretty consistent with, um, I think Max and Jessica's work about sort of what kind of information these lobbying groups are conveying and what sort of um, needs they're filling in for the government. Um, so in other work, I find that um, when these protests are conveying information that the city had, city government has struggled to observe, um, they're much more likely to make a concession than actually 
fulfill that concession. And actually we see that as well on a national level in Russia. There are cases where protests, uh, there was a pension reform in 2018 um, that the national government had a difficult time gathering information about precisely how to calibrate that policy. It was an extremely unpopular policy. Um, and they actually um, sort of allowed protests to proceed to gather information about the extent of opposition to that policy so they could sort of fine tune the, um, the policy at the end of the day. Um, in regards to the second question about escalation, um, at least in the protests that I look at, I mean, they're extremely small. So the number of people who were involved in them, um, even if they all banded together, could probably not uh, meaningfully challenge um, the government. But there are kind of two sort of paths there of people who stay in involved in politics, um, as well as um, this is something we see outside of uh, these particular protests in Moscow. Um, and that is either sort of getting involved um, in sort of increasingly antagonistic behavior, um, where you are, you know, increasingly radical or getting involved in sort of more serious opposition type protest activity about these high level political issues. Um, and then there's kind of an avenue of co-optation as well. Like there are other organizations that, um, none that um, I think appear in my data set, but elsewhere in Russia that have started out as sort of um, oppositional, or let's say like slightly more antagonistic than some of the organizations I look at um, on policy the issues that then kind of get co-opted by the government and sort of want to preserve their influence and profile. Um, so it can kind of go, um, I think, both ways. There are also cases of people getting involved in local elected office um, who sort of became exposed to politics um, as part of these local protests in Moscow, for example. Um, and that is, uh, one might qualify that as a kind of, I don't know, more radicalization um, or a more antagonistic perspective. These people are occupying offices that really don't have a lot of political power associated with them because there are very, very few opposition candidates in these, um, in these bodies. Um, and that also exposes those people to a great deal more um, like personal risk. Um, and many of them have encountered um, a pretty significant repression. That's great. I actually want to turn things back to China now, um, because, you know, this one thing we know, and Manfred's got his hand up anyway, but one thing we know is that the, the, the Chinese system is supposedly very good at preventing escalation, you know, keeping protests locked at the level that they are. But I'm curious, both Manfred and also Jessica, from your own work, to the question of longevity and to the question of reneging. So to what degree you've, you've both shown how advocacy groups, labor protests, what have you, can, can make some headway. But are those really um, are those really vulnerable to to backslide and to reneging um, and not having a lot of longevity? I mean, recognizing we're not going to see escalation, but what about that side of it? I'll jump in first, if that's all right. Um, <clears throat> I think the state just gains a general sort of nimbleness with uh, dealing with different social demands through this back and forth, and that stays and is part of what I think of as responsive capacity, but like specific gains aren't locked in and uh, when the when the pressure recedes a lot of those uh, specific policies can be undone and you're seeing that a little bit right now I think in China as uh, labor unrest is, is starting to ebb a little bit um, the government's uh, pulling back on some of its uh, previous concessions uh, just quick second point uh, I think uh, precisely because the government's concerned about, a spiral developing of more concessions and more activism, uh, precisely for that reason, it uh, doles out repression along with uh, whatever responsiveness it gives, and it tries to keep those things in balance. Yeah, you know, what you just said about China and labor, too, reminds me a bit of the of the Russia story. You know, I remember Graham Robertson did all this amazing work on labor protests in, in Russia back in the 90s. Um, and, you know, kind of reminds me of some of the work you're doing as well. And this is before Putin came along and you get a lot, lot less room for labor protests to make a difference. So it'd be kind of interesting to put Russia, China on the together on the labor question as well. But Jessica, what about you? Do you think the are you, you kind of with Manfred on this in terms of the the gain civil society gets in china tend to be pretty pretty fragile pretty uh reversible 
Um, I guess I don't see a lot of differences between what advocacy groups get in democracies versus authoritarian regimes in that in both cases, if you're not able to maintain pressure and sort of a visible presence, you know, politicians sort of push you off and go on to the next big issue that's catching everybody's attention. And so, you know, in, in China, mostly what I see are the groups that are able to either institutionalize their solution so it becomes part of regulations and it doesn't require an act of political will to keep it going, but it's just part of regulations. Those tend to persist and the ones that solve a governance problem. So something that the government really wants resolved, they haven't been able to figure out their own solution and a group comes up with the solution and they can sort of take it and solve a problem. So those are the, the two cases where I see that it's easier to really capture those gains and keep them. Otherwise, just like in democracies, you know, there are always other problems popping up. And so once attention gets diverted, I think it's really challenging to, to keep those successes in place. Yeah, it makes sense. So I want to give uh, give gave David Zaccone the last the last word here, both by this question of this escalation question, because one thing I'm wondering is, so if you're a businessman who runs for mayor or you you become governor, do you try to keep? I mean, is there this need will need to get higher office, higher office, whether in Russia or elsewhere? Um, and again, Adam Casey has another question here, which is I think related to this: How does this kind of business involvement in uh, in politics, you know, affect business attitudes toward democratization? as well. So, which is another kind of escalation, if you will, but I'd be curious for your take in Russia or elsewhere from your research on that. Yeah, great questions. I think, um, you know, this latter one depends on how you define democratization. If you define it really narrowly as just turnover of elites, um, then yes, I think business participation in government is associated with a lot more change. And because, and the main, one main point that I find is that business people if there's no room in the ruling party, they look at other parties because they need access. They need their businesses to survive. And in Russia, with the amount of systemic and non-systemic opposition parties that are out there, there's there's viable options. And they're also very profitable that you can make money by adopting this sort of oppositional role. But those opposition parties are, are living under like really, really heavy constraints about their movement and about the type of platforms and ideas that they could promote and the, the regime is really ready to step in and block and this gets to Dan's question anybody that's whipping up too much and that's actually trying to advocate regime change or advocate more federal or national political change so at the local and, and even at the regional level there's a lot of competition fueled by market competitions the more businesses you have the the, the tighter profits are the the, the scarcity and, and that type of back up against the wall in the economic sphere is going to lead to a lot more competition in the political sphere and maybe some diversity in terms of the political groupings that emerge but what we've also found is that if those if that tension gets too heated if the business people start you know, stepping out of line and saying things that are egregious or saying things that are aggressive from a political standpoint, the regime is very willing to, to use the other tools that are available, whether it be expropriation, whether it be the security services, whether it just be harassment and other sorts of pressure to make sure that business people know that their assets are under threat if they refuse to kind of comply or be or remain so obedient to the kind of ruling party priorities. So in that sense, I see a lot of political competition that's going to increase as the uh, the pie gets smaller and, and, and more intensely fought over in Russia. And the real question is whether or not the regime it can figure out how to keep regional and local competition kind of packaged and constrained and confined to those areas without spilling over to Moscow and St. Petersburg, where it actually threatens to, to challenge the national authorities. But so far, they've been, they've been okay with some kind of local and regional competition. Um, and I think that's very similar to China, is that you need to channel that dissent somewhere, but just make sure that it stays out of, out of, out of federal institutions, because that's where the real risks to the power center are. Fantastic. Well, lots of interesting things to watch happening, both, both within uh, Russia and China, as well as in their external relations with their neighbors. Um, so lots to, to look for. Um, before we go, I want to send a, a quick thanks, uh, most of all, to Derek Groom, um, our program manager for, as always, doing such a brilliant job putting this all together. Um, I also want to give a big thanks to, uh, to Adam Casey uh, at WCED for filling in for me. Uh, at our our previous uh, event, our flashpoint event on Kazakhstan, uh, when I had to be on leave, so that was a, an enormous help, and thanks Tim for that. Um, our next event uh, we're going to have in person is the plan, uh, Omicron willing, 
uh, February 15th. Uh, we're going to be trying to meet in person for uh, Charlotte Cavalier's uh, talk on her book. Um, and that's within our series, our thematic series for the year on capitalism and democracy. She'll be speaking on her book project, Fair Enough, Fairness, Reasoning, and Demand for Redistribution. Um, but for today, I think that was an amazing set of, of, of presentations on both the general um, dynamics of autocratic lobbying and also some amazing details from cases. So above all else, thanks, David Sacconi, Jessica Teets, Manfred Elfstrom, uh, Max Grumping, and Sasha DeVogel. So everyone be safe, take care, and look forward to seeing you next month, uh, hopefully in the International Institute. So take care.